a lot of times you have a scenario where someone may have hurt your feelings, but you're able to move on. It hurts, it was painful, but you're able to, you're able to move on. But sometimes, especially if it's like vicious, especially if it's in public, it's hard. It's hard to let go. It's hard to forgive. And when you don't forgive, what ends up happening is, is that you're carrying with you this this extra baggage, and it affects affects your feelings, affects your energy, it could even affect your health. Not to show. If you, if you think about how someone wronged you and it's, and it's on your mind, not only does it affect your feelings, it can affect your health. It certainly affects friendships, affects couples, and sometimes. Um, you know, you, you want to forgive, you want to let go, and you just, and, and, and it seems like there's some that kind of blockage, not letting you forgive. And so the question is, um, it could be like, for example, a couple, where the husband realizes he made a mistake right away. We're talking to them guys over here, right? The husband realizes he made a mistake right away, and he apologizes. And the wife knows he's sorry. Now he's sorry. He already did he already acted differently. He already, he already showed that he got it, that he's acting differently. And yet, she doesn't even know why, but she can't forgive. She can't move on. And the question is, where does it come from? So we learn the answer to this and how to deal with this in this week's Torah portion. This week, the Torah says that after Jewish people um, discover that they're not going to go immediately to Israel, they got despondent, they lost hope, and they got upset. And they said, they complained. There's no bread. There's no water, and they're upset. And what happens? What happens is, is that the snakes come, and unfortunately, many people died. And then the Jewish people come to Moshe and ask Moshe to pray for them. And Moshe immediately prays for them, and they're healed. They're healed. Moshe tells Moshe what to do: to put a copper snake up, and everyone was bit by the snake. Should look at the copper snake, and then they're healed. So the Talmud says, we hear, we learn from this, that you shouldn't be cruel and not forgive. When someone asks you for forgiveness, you should forgive them. We learn this from here, Rashi says. But if you look in the source of Rashi, Rashi is quoting from the Medrash. And there are actually two instances in the Torah where we learn you're supposed to forgive. Here, and the first instance is in the story of Avimelech. When Avimelech abducts Sarah, He has a dream. Hashem tells him you deserve the death penalty because you took this woman. And the next day, Avimelech says to Avram that he made a mistake. Well, uh, he made a, not only he made a mistake, he said that that uh, he got a disease. He got a disease and his whole family got a disease. And the disease was they weren't able to go to the bathroom. It was very painful. And so they asked Avram to forgive them and to pray for them. So Torah says Avram prayed for them and they were Vayeledu and they were healed. So which is a more of a surprising thing? This forgiveness of Moshe Rabbeinu, forgiveness of Avram. Which is harder to forgive? Someone abducts your wife, or if somebody is complaining about the food in the desert. You know, it's, it, it, it would seem that Avram Avinu has a, his story it seems to be far more um, far more dramatic his forgiveness than the story of Moshe Rabbeinu Moshe Rabbeinu they're, they're complaining they're in the desert bad food bad drink we can relate to it and we can put ourselves in their situation but Avinu his forgiveness to Avimelech who adopted his wife that's it seems to be a far of a greater forgiveness and yet the Torah says that's not the source Rashi says the source of forgiveness is not from Avraham. The reason we know you're supposed to forgive someone when they ask you for forgiveness is specifically from the story of Moshe Rabbein. And the reason is this. There are two different kinds of, of forgiveness. There's a, there's a very powerful teaching in the Rebbe which really has to do with each of us. There's one kind of forgiveness where you're focused on the mistake. And you forgive the mistake. What does that mean? At first, when someone hurts you, what do you feel? You feel you want, you want to take vengeance. You want to, want to get back at them. 
if you can't get back at them, you hope that Hashem gets back at them. You hope that they get punished. And forgiveness means they're able to move past the pain and wish them well and hope well happens to them. Not to want to have vengeance. That's one kind of forgiveness. Where your focus is the mistake, focus is the action, and the forgiveness is also on the action. You're forgiving the action, you wish them well, they shouldn't be punished for their action. And there's another kind of forgiveness. It's not that you're extricated from your feelings of vengeance because of the action that was done to you, but a higher, deeper forgiveness is, is that you actually are able to be connected to the person that wronged you. Be able to be reconciled to the person that wronged you. In other words, not only are you not angry at this person, but not only are you friends with him despite the fact that he hurt your feelings, but you're as if it never happened, or even better, sometimes it happens like this, and we all know different scenarios in our own lives, and the person that actually wronged you because of this, you actually have a deep relationship than you, they would have had had this not happened. Everyone knows this from their own children. You know the, yeah. the, you know the child you, you, you have to do with the most? The child you have deepest connection with? The child who tries your nerves the most. <laughs> That's a child that you really get to learn who they are, and they get to learn who you are. And the different kind, it could be that there's, there's some frustration along the way, but that's a child that they really knows you and you really know them, the deeper kind of connection. So this is also what happens sometimes when there is a deeper, higher forgiveness. Ah, you forgive the action, you forgive the person. So by Avram Avinu, what does it say by Avram Avinu? He prayed for them and they were healed. The focus was that they should be healed. The focus was that they should recover. By Moshe Rabbeinu, he prayed for the people. He didn't pray for the illness. He didn't pray because of the snakes only. He wanted them to not be in the sorry state that they were in before. They were in a state of complaining and they were in a dark place. And Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to lift them up. Now the Torah says, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu to put the copper snake up and you should look at the copper snake. What does it mean looking at the copper snake? How does that solve anything? So Talmud says, it's not the copper snake. It's, it's looking up. Look up at Hashem. Okay, if that's what it means, then why look up at a copper snake? Look up at the sky. What's he looking up at the copper snake? So we discussed this a few times. The idea is very simple. When the previous Shepherd was in prison, so he said that he didn't know what time it was because there's no clocks. And he said, I felt like Moshe Rabbeinu on Mount Sinai. Moshe Rabbeinu had to learn the written Torah during the daytime and the oral Torah at nighttime, as a custom is. And Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know what time it was, because no clocks in heaven. How did Moshe Rabbeinu know what time it was? He listened to the songs of the angels. When the angels said, Kadosh, Moshe Rabbeinu knew it was daytime, time to learn the written Torah. He, when he said, Baruch, 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 he knew it was nighttime, learned the oral Torah. So the previous Shabbat said the same as with me. When the guards did roll call, and they called up all the prisoners' name, he had to say, I'm here. He knew it was this time. When the guards called everyone outside, for a few minutes, I think whatever time that they had, it was that time. So based upon the order of the prison, you knew you knew what time it was. Okay, so it makes sense the comparison somewhat, but just that line. I felt like Moshe Rabbeinu on Mount Sinai. <laughs> Who feels like Moshe Rabbeinu on Mount Sinai when you're in the worst place in the world, physically, the worst place in the world, spiritually? How do you feel like Moshe Rabbeinu on Mount Sinai? What does that mean? So another story, the previous Shabbat that explains this. The previous Shabbat, famous story, how this guard the interrogator of the KGB puts a gun to the previous Rebbe's head and he tells the previous Rebbe tell us where your Hasidim are tell us where they're teaching Torah we want to know who is teaching what where this toy they told the previous Rebbe has a way of making people speak so the Rebbe said this toy can only frighten someone who has one world and many gods but someone who has two worlds and one god this toy does not mean a thing the Rebbe emphasized two points. The first point we can readily understand. If there's only one world, then a gun is supreme. But the Rebbe emphasized a second point. The second point was that there's one God. Why is that point relevant? Let's say he believes in ten gods and five gods. What does that have to do with a gun? What he was addressing is, you might think good things happen from the good God and bad things happen from a bad God. Now the, the previous Rebbe is under the jurisdiction of the KGB officer. He's now in the hands of the bad God. People have that that pagan thought process. So the previous step said, I believe in one God. That there's no other force other than Him. And therefore, there's no KGB, and there's no gun, and it doesn't exist. All there is is Hashem. 
And even you raving the gun at me is, is nothing, that's, 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 that's external. I'm only in the hands of Hashem, nothing else. This is the meaning of the snakes. Ordinarily, when a snake bites you, what do you think? You think that there's other, some, something else. There's a bad God. There's something else coming uh, biting me. It's not Hashem. The healing starts by realizing that whatever is happening to you is happening by Hashem's hand. It's not happening by accident. It's happening by Hashem's hand. It's by looking up and realizing the snake is coming from Hashem. That's the meaning of looking up and seeing the snake, realizing even the pain that I'm experiencing is also sent to me by Hashem for a divine purpose. It's not happening by accident. Even the pain, even the confusion, even the things I don't like, it's not happening because of some other force. It's happening by divine providence from Hashem who loves me. And that feeling itself is the beginning of healing. So this is the meaning of Moshe Rabbeinu's prayer. Moshe Rabbeinu was praying for the people, and Hashem therefore gave him the instruction how to help the people. He told them, he told Moshe Rabbeinu, I want you to create the copper snake. Why did Moshe have to do it? Because Moshe wanted to help them. Moshe wanted to lift them up. He didn't just want them not to have the snakes. He wanted them to lift them up. They, should be, they shouldn't be in that state. He wanted to elevate them. So this is a different kind of forgiveness. This is a forgiveness that elevates the person who forgives and elevates a person who's forgiven. But the question again is, how do you do it? If, especially if you're hurt so deeply, how can you forgive? So sometimes people say, I can't forgive. I don't know why, but I can't forgive. And it sounds like that it's true. I can move past it. I wish this wouldn't have happened. If this happened, I can't forgive. But the, the, the truth is that there is a resistance to forgiving. There's a reason why we don't want to forgive. Why don't we want to, want to forgive? If you hurt me, then I look at you as the villain, and I look at myself as the victim. I look at you as darkness. Look at, I look at myself as light. I look at you as down, as low. I look at myself as big, as strong. Somehow I feel the feelings of anger that I have are elevating me. They make me feel better than you. So that's why people don't want to get let go of the feelings of anger because it hurts the ego. The anger is helping them feel better about themselves, to a certain extent, externally at least, and that's why it's hard to let go of the anger. But the truth is that we can go deeper. In Hebrew, the word for forgiveness is the same as the word for tunnel. A tunnel, deep within yourself, there is an neshama, there's a soul. And not only do we have the power to move past the wrongdoing, but we have the power to reach a deeper, higher kind of forgiveness, forgiving the person. How do we do that? We have to dig really deep. And when you dig really deep, you know what happens? It's really, really important to know this. When you dig really deep and you forgive, you discover a part of yourself that you wouldn't have the opportunity to be in touch with had you not forgiven. Had you not, this person not, not done this wrongdoing to you. In other words, how often you get a chance to meet your soul? What, 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 on a regular day, what puts you in touch with your neshama? Okay, you daven. You could daven with feelings and thoughts which aren't so holy. You could daven and not, you could get stuck, you could go on Torah and not be in touch with your neshama. It, it, it deep, subconsciously, it's from your soul, it's true, your soul wants to tear your soul wants to daven, your soul wants to give, but do you feel your neshama? But when you forgive, the power to forgive that comes from deep within the neshama. So when, we, when, you, when you're able to forgive, you can look at your life, you can, you're able to say, you have to do this. You can look at all the pain that you had. You're able to look back at the pain. You're able to say, this happened. I had this pain, and I let go of it. I let go of this pain. And um, I chose to, to let go of this. And, I, and when you do this, when you decide, how do you do this? Let me break that down. When you decide to realize that you don't want to have the foolish thinking that you had before. What was the thinking you had before? Why were you so angry? You felt this person hurt you. You felt there was a snake. This is the snake. This is the snake. This is the guy who attacked me. He's the snake. What's healing mean? Healing means you realize there is no, that there is no snake. There is no person that could hurt you. There's no person who could help you. and no person who could hurt you. There's, you're only in the hands of Hashem. Being angry, the Gemara says, anyone gets, gets angry, Chachmas Mistalakas and Menu. And if it gets angry, their wisdom departs from them. Why, did, why is the wisdom going to depart from them? Because the very fact you're angry means you're out of touch with reality. You don't realize what's going on. When David HaMelech 
The author writes in Tanya, something we have to engrave into ourselves. If you engrave into yourself, you live a different, a different, a different life. The author says in Tanya that when Davin Amalek was cursed by Shimi Mengera, Davin Amalek said these words, Hashem said to Shimi to curse me. Shimi it sounds like Shimi was a prophet. It sounds like Shimi was like Moshe Rabbeinu. Shem spoke through his vocal cords. There's Shechin is speaking with the words of this wicked person who's cursing David Amalek. That's what it sounds like. But that's not what it means. What it means is David Amalek realized that if I'm being cursed, it's Hashem wants me to have this humiliation. It's not him. He has no power to do this to me. Hashem, Amr Leikalo, as all the rights over there, the Machshava Zu, Yorda Lemoiche Velibe Shoshim Meit Hashem and Hashemayim. This thought came down to Shimi from Hashem from Shemaim. It wasn't, it wasn't his own idea to have this thought. It's Hashem sent him this thought. Hashem gave him this thought. Not only that, Allah goes further. Not only did Hashem give him the thought, but Hashem creates the world every second. The world is created out of nothingness. How could something continue to exist? What's going to support the world once it was created out of nothingness? If to throw a rock to the air, you have to have a constant force to go against it because you're, you're trying to bring the rock against its nature into the air against gravity. Just make a slight change in, in, in something requires a constant force. To bring the world into existence after it didn't exist before, it is a constant force that need, 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 needs to keep the world in existence. So when Shimi is cursing Davon Amalek, who is animating Shimi? Who is creating Shimi? It's Hashem, not just making him the idea to do it, but the very stuff of Shimi, everything about Shimi, the whole picture of Shimi, whatever Shimi is doing, every fiber of Shimi's yeah. being is being brought into the world from Hashem every single moment. So David and Melech, he realized this. And therefore David and Melech didn't get angry. This is a way, this is the key to realize, to, 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 um, to heal ourselves from this anger is by thinking about how everything that happens by divine providence. So there's no person. He was executed because of this. That's because he does need to get killed. But that wasn't yeah. relevant to David and Melech. Meaning, what happens? What has happened to the other says in Tanya? Harbi shluchem amokim, alabal nigzak har nigzum nashamayim. But the person who does the wrongdoing is nana sharei bechirase. The person decided to be a bad messenger. He decided if Reuven decides to kill Shimon, it's impossible for Shimon to die unless Hashem decided he should die. But Reuven, who killed Shimon, is still punished. Al rei bechirase because he made the bad decision to be that messenger. But it cannot possibly hurt or Shimon at all. It's impossible. So this is this is one important point to, to heal ourselves, to be able to reconcile with another person. It's real that no person ever hurt you in the first place. Another important point is this. Rest coming out from Gimel Tamas. But he, he was not killed because of because of the Klala. So he punished him because of other reasons. Little because of this reason. It's, it, it, he mentions the curse. He says, yeah, so, he, but, he, but, he, but it's, it's, the point is, it's not that Dhamma felt a reaction to his curse. Dhamma thought this happened to me from Hashem. What has to happen to him, well, that will be dealt with. That, that's, that's, that's Hashem's business, what has to happen to him. It's not my business. Yeah. There was, um, Randall Futafas was once for a ring. He says, what, what happens when you do Kaparis? You take the chicken, you swing it around your head, and in Los Angeles we have bags for the chickens. What happens if you don't have a bag for your chicken? Your chicken goes, makes on your head. What do you do? <laughs> you start thinking how terrible this is, how bad this is. You know what you do? You know what you do? You wipe yourself off and you move on. There was a boy in yeshiva. He's sitting in the bathroom in the yeshiva. True story. <laughs> and there wasn't so many tissues. And, it's, and he's so upset. He's so upset that she doesn't have tissues. How can she not have tissues? Crazy. He's sitting in the toilet, no tissues. He gets up, he goes back to the synagogue, and he's studying with his partner. He starts telling how terrible every member of the administration of the yeshiva is. How terrible this rabbi is. And they don't even have tissues. In the to- and the, the, his friend says to him, listen, the yeshiva may be doing terrible things, but the one who smells is you. <laughs> who said that? Yeshiva student, yeshiva student. The one who smells is you. I think, I think it was Rabbi, Rabbi, um, Rabbi Kesselman. Anyways, so um, the point is that when we don't forgive someone, we think we're, we're hurting them, we're getting back at them. Actually, the one who is smelling, the one who is being hurt is ourselves. But here's a very important point to get past. It. Coming out from Gimel Tammuz, the Rebbe's day. 
there's a famous exchange they ever had with Rabbi Weinberg on the show. Rabbi Weinberg would give a Tanya share every week on Saturday night. And before his Tanya share on Thursday, he would give the Rebbe his notes. One time, he uh, w- wanted to give his notes into the Rebbe, and he wasn't able to, and he put it in the door. He was hoping the Rebbe's secretary would see it. And instead of the Rebbe's secretary seeing it, the notes fell on the floor, and the Rebbe himself walked out of the room with the secretary. He lifted up the notes from the floor. So this Rabbi Weinberg, he was deeply upset. He caused the Rebbe to bend down and to lift this up. And he asked the Rebbe if the Rebbe could find this. And he wrote a letter to the Rebbe, can you please forgive me for what I did? I hope you're not angry at me. So the Rebbe responded, like, which is something that tells us a lot about what the Rebbe is. It tells us everything what the Rebbe is. It tells us also who we need to be. As Chassidim, as Chetak the Rebbe, coming from the Mutam, what a Jew needs to be. The Rebbe said to lift up he wrote, underlined the word to lift up in his letter. You made me lift up. I said, to uplift, to lift up, this is my whole essence. My whole essence is to lift up. Especially, the Rebbe said, what others overlook. To lift up is what my whole essence is about, especially what others overlook. So when we're preoccupied on lifting other people up, we don't get so, we, we, we realize the value of who we are we don't get so so angry by little things. It's your daughter's wedding. Daughter's wedding. You're walking to your daughter to the chuppah. And someone someone right runs in front of you. And they stop you. They block you. What do you do? You get angry at them? You yell at them by the, by the chuppah? You walk around them. Why? Because this is nothing. It's your daughter's wedding. It doesn't bother you. So if you felt about, about yourself that you are an emissary of Hashem to bring Mashiach, lift up the world. I was just now in New York. I met the Rebbe's emissary to, um, to the college in Sterot. What's his name? Ro- Rosenthal. Unbelievable this guy. Full of happiness. Full of uh, simcha. And then I said to him, I, I was thinking about this, what a special guy this guy. So energy, so, 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 so wise. So where are you from? Sterot. Like, wow. How could he be from Sterot, this guy? You, you know, right, you know, think of Sterot, you know, such, 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 um, such a challenge to live in that place with the, all the terrorism and the bombing and the non-stop, and your family's there, and this guy is he's above it. He's above it. How is he above it? He said an amazing thing. <laughs> amazing thing he said. He said that the Alter Rebbe had a chas to the Pinchas Rezis. The Pinchas Rezis, one time, make a long story short, the Pinchas Rezis said, Rebbe, it was one, I think it was, it was Sukkot, is a Rebbe. And the like, why did you just say Rebbe? What happened? He said, the Rebbe just thought about me. The Alter Rebbe just thought about me. Alter, and it was true. At that moment, the Alter Rebbe had mentioned him. He wasn't living, he wasn't at that time in, with the Alter Rebbe, but he knew it. And the Chassidim were upset at him. Why? Because for Chassidim, having divine inspiration, seeing the future, is something that only Tzadikim are, are supposed to have. You, know, you just know your place. Divine inspiration and, and, and prophecy is not, is, not, is, not, is not for the average guy. What, what are you doing over here? What are you mixing into big things? He said, I promise you I don't have divine inspiration. <laughs> They're about to beat him up. Yeah, how dare you? <laughs> I promise you. He so how did I know? He said, I met the Alter Rebbe the first time. I gave him my nefesh. When I met him the second time, I gave him my ruach. When I met him the third time, I gave him my nesham. What does that mean, nefesh ruach neshama? Nefesh is our power to have obedience to Hashem. Ruach is our ability to uh, have feelings for Hashem. And neshama is our ability to understand the oneness of Hashem. So I gave the Alter Rebbe all these parts of our, my soul. And that's why I, I could feel when the Rebbe was thinking about me. So this, this gentleman, this rabbi from the Sterot, he said, let's do that. So I said, how do you do that? What are you talking about? He says, you have to decide. Nefesh means, he said, you, you want to do the right thing. Ruach means, to always, be besim, always be happy. The Rebbe asks of each of us to always be besimcha. He says, you have to, oh, you want to give your Ruach to the Rebbe? Always smile, always be besimcha. And neshama, how do you give your neshama, how do you give your power of understanding, to learn chassidus, learn deeply, to scuba dive into chassidus. This guy was, I mean, I felt like, like he really, like he, he, he got somewhere with this, you know? He's, he's, anyways, my, the point is that um, when we feel, realize who, we, who we're connected to, and we realize what our mission is, then the, these things don't, don't bother us as much. We have to realize that forgiveness makes me greater, lifts me up. Forgiveness forces me to grow. It forces me to go beyond the things that hurt me. And it might seem hard, but everyone has it deep within themselves. And I have the ability to go beyond the things that limit my freedom. 
I, ha- I just need to make a step to live deeper. And by doing this, by forgiving, I'm going to discover, a, make a tunnel and discover a deeper, higher majesty in my soul. A higher soul energy that illuminates my whole entire life. But I just want to mention one more point. Forgiveness also has to be for ourselves. A lot of times people are hard on themselves. And we somehow think that if I am angry about what I did, I am, if I forgive myself for what I did and I move on, I'm, I'm strengthening the bad mistake I made. It's not true. It's not true. It's a lie. Being angry at yourself is a waste of energy. It doesn't accomplish anything. In the contrary, it, it stops you. It limits you. We're learning this week about the red heifer, the paraduma. The Baal Shem Tov said, what's the paraduma? It says, it makes pure those who are impure and it makes impure those who are pure. Baal Shem Tov said, you know what that means? What's a paraduma? Paraduma is realizing your self-worth. Realizing how valuable you are. How precious you are. If someone's on a higher level, a tzaddik, they don't need to think about that. That's, that's, that's a, that, 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 they're already in a state of devotion to Hashem. But a regular person, because of all the things that we've done wrong in our life, we're, we, we, don't, we don't realize the power that we're able to actually do a mitzvah. We're able to actually, to, actually to connect Hashem's mission for us. So by realizing and thinking about how special we are, by, 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 by realizing how para, para comes from the word lifrot, they're both, how we're able to be fruitful and multiplying to achieve, that thought, that meditation about our, our own goodness, that's betayer at atameim. The word tame in Hebrew means to be constricted, means to be confined, means not to be able to, means to be repressed, not to be able to express yourself. What's metayer at what frees you and opens you up is this recognition of, of your greatness, of your, of your goodness, of your specialness. It, and, it, and there's nothing that is unforgivable. Nothing you've done in your life is unforgivable, no such thing. Instead of thinking about how terrible whatever you've done, you've done is, instead of thinking that, do something else. You know what you should do? You should think of what you need to do better. But everyone said, one action is better than a thousand sighs. I showed it with you. When the Rebbe said that, the guy sitting behind the Rebbe and goes, Oi! One action is better than a thousand sighs. He goes, Oi! The Rebbe turned around to him, middle of the Fabring, and the Rebbe said to him, when a Jew hears that one action is better than a thousand sighs, what does he do? He starts to sigh. It's the opposite of the path of Chabad. It's the opposite of serving Hashem with joy. It's true, the Rebbe said. You have to know what you've done wrong, but not that you should feel like a doormat in order to know what to do the next day to move on. So Hashem should help us. We should <coughs> embrace the mission Hashem has given us with Umayn. simcha to live off. And, huh? and we, should, we should go with simcha and forgive ourselves, give other people. And that's how we'll dig a tunnel to reveal the deepest, the, 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 the Mashiach which is within us. Actually, Simcha Shikh